welcome everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton. I'm the series director. I hope that you are enjoying the last vestiges of summer on this very hot and steamy day, uh, as the sun is very soon to cross over the celestial equator, marking the autumnal equinox this Saturday at 9.54 p.m. to be exact, when day and night will be equal. Uh, we will then move quickly into darkness with shorter days, and summer will be but a distant memory. So, celebrating light and color today, we are very pleased to present a most vibrant artist and designer here direct from London, Morag myers Koff. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Let's all get together. Okay, so a big thank you to our partners today for their support. Uh, Design Corps, uh, Detroit month of design with 41 events this month, so check them out. The Institute for the Humanities uh, and Gifts of Art at Michigan Medicine and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Uh, briefly before we get started, I do want to introduce and welcome a special group that is here with us today. In the audience, we have the Stamp School Dean's Advisory Council. Uh, this is an important group for us at the Stamp School. The council is comprised of alumni who have embarked from the school here and found their success in the world and come back to share it with us. So let them be an example to you students and a beacon that you too will find your path. Uh, we honor their knowledge and appreciate their dedication in coming back to help guide us. So thank you all for your time and energy. Please, let's give a round of applause for the Stamps School Dean's Advisory Committee. Um, one event announcement for you tomorrow evening, Friday. Join us at the Stamps Gallery. This will be the opening of Have We Met? Dialogues on Memory and Desire, a new exhibition which is inspired by Ann Arbor's own legacy of social movements and experimental art practices. So there'll be an opening reception tomorrow evening starting at 6 o'clock. There'll be live DJ refreshments and a performance by Stamp School's own Buster Simpson. Uh, this will be located at the Stamps Gallery on division uh, that's between Liberty and Washington so please do join us. Uh, we will have a Q&A today in our regular fashion in the screening room so if you'd like to come join us directly after the presentation here and meet Morag and ask her questions exit the theater go to the left down the hallway and on the right there you'll find the screening room uh, so do remember to turn off your cell phones and now for a proper introduction of our guest today I've invited one of our uh, event partners to do the honors so that I could highlight her terrific program uh, gifts of art has been bringing the world of art and music to Michigan Medicine for over 30 years. It's one of the first and most comprehensive arts and medicine programs in the country. It's been named a best practice program by the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, its many, many offerings bring live music and art to public spaces throughout the U of M hospitals and directly to the bedsides of patients. So this work touches the lives of so many people in some of their most vulnerable and dark moments. And you will see a correlation with our speaker today and why Gifts of Art is thrilled to introduce her to you, please welcome Gifts of Art director, Elaine Sims. Thank you, Christina. Wow, I can't see any of you at all. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of the Penny Stamp series and a really big fan of today's guest. So it's a double honor to be here introducing her to you. Um, I came here to the University of Michigan in 1964. Those were the days when the old School of Art and Design, some of you in the uh, alumni might remember that, um, was in Lorch Hall, and Michigan Theater was not here showing films, but it was in Cinema Guild in that location. So I came here in the early 1960s with the drab and very um, staid, world of the 1950s, early 60s, and when I left in 1968, the world was exploding into psychedelic colors. So is it any question that I would absolutely love the work of Morag Myerskoff? Her mantra is, to make happy those who are near and those who are far will come, and I think that's wonderful. 
Born and bred in London, Morag has always lived in the city and has been fascinated by how color and pattern and words can change urban environments and people's perception of spaces and places. From schools to my world of hospitals to cultural hubs and town centers, Morag transforms public spaces by creating engaging experiences for everyone. The Temple of Agape, built for the Festival of Love, sounds like the Year of Love, <laughs> in London's South Bank in 2014, used public space to create an open, interactive symbol of devotion to love in all its many forms. Her strong visual approach is instantly recognizable and elevates every context in which it is placed. Her work is rooted in creating a sense of joy and belonging for all those who encounter it. Morag creates specific local responses to each distinct audience that will see and experience her work, using it to create community and to build identity. Morag's visual vocabulary is inclusive by nature, and its effortless energy resonates both visually and emotionally with audiences well beyond geographical and cultural boundaries. Morag's contribution to educational environments was recognized in 2015 when her work with Alford Hall Monaghan Morris in Burntwood School won the Sterling Prize for Architecture. She was made an RSA Royal Designer for Industry in 2017. Her work has been widely published around the world for her social approach to project and her distinct use of color and pattern, often incorporating positive messaging. So it was with Great pleasure and admiration, I welcome Murag Myerscroft. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Penny Stamps, for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Hello. Um, so, um, right, I'm going to talk about me and uh, what I do, and let's start and see if I can um, do it in the right period of time. Okay, belonging. So, as you heard before, my mantra is, make happy those who are near and those who are far will come, and hopefully, by the end of it, you'll see why. So, I'm born and bred London, and I've lived there all my life. And, um, but my family come from various places. Um, my great-grandfather was originally born in the workhouse in uh, London, so very poor, and ran away to the circus. And he became a clown. And when he was at the circus, he met my grandmother, who was German, and she, they didn't know what to do with her, and I'll show you what she did in a minute. You might be able to guess from her clothes. And they ended, he ended up being in this permanent circus in Paris until his mother from London came and got him and brought him back to England. But my grandmother, my great-grandmother, was a high diver because they couldn't find anything for her, anything else for her to do. And I think this is quite... Like, this was quite hardcore. If you don't get it, if you don't do it properly, there's not much hope. You have, like, one or two chances. And I only actually realized what a high diver was. I thought she was on a trapeze. I didn't realize she went in a pool of water um, until I watched a film and saw what that was. So, back in Holloway, so my grandmother gets my my great-grandmother gets my great... No, my great-great-grandmother gets my great-grandfather to come back, live in this house in London, in Holloway, in a terraced house. And this is what they look like. They didn't always dress like this, but this is, um, this is them in, in London. They didn't quite fit in, I think, to, to the London ways. And then my, my grandfather... Um, married, actually, she's my, she, they were second cousins. This is my French grandmother. And when she came to London, she was rather disappointed, I think, to say the least. And so in her house, she transformed her living room 
into a French salon, got all her family to paint everything and, and made this fantasy world for herself. And this is my great-grandfather who did the painting, and he was um, a salon painter in Paris. This is my father, who's a who, who was a classical musician, that's his name on the top. So a very bohemian family, absolutely no money, just um, very sort of lived days, lived uh, every day as it came and enjoyed it or didn't. So my dad used to practice, this is me, I didn't really like practicing. I can't play an instrument and I can't speak French either. And this is my mum, she's Scottish. My dad met her up in Scotland, brought her down to London. They got married in three months and then we came along. And, um, and that's me in the middle. So I think I, I, I realized from, living, from being at home in a making and musical household, I, I really like making. And this is what I played in when I was, um, we used to have a spaceship and I used to like escaping because I did feel a little bit of an outsider at school. I didn't really tell them at school what our fa family was like. Um, you know, we didn't eat our dinner at five o'clock, we ate it at nine o'clock, my dad drank wine, you know, it wasn't just, just wasn't right in London at that time. And then I really, really loved the banana split. <laughs> So I think that that's where I, I used to go Saturday morning pictures and that's where I could see colour TV. This is a long time ago, you can tell. Um, so this is me at the, um, at the, when I went to St. Martin's, I went, I decided, although my parents were artists, I didn't really just want to follow them and then I made my own decision and decided I would go to art school. <laughs> and I went to St. Martin's and then, um, I do look a bit like the um, murderer, Myra Hindley there, don't I? So that's, uh, that's me at the, at the Royal College. And I didn't fit in. I, again, I did graphics, um, and everybody was doing posters, and I wanted to design opera sets, and I really loved uh, Warhol, I loved Memphis, and I went to the amazing exhibition by David Hockney, paints, Hockney Paints the Stage, and it just absolutely blew my mind, and I think that sort of paved the way for the rest of my career, really, to be able to transform these spaces into um, whatever you wanted it to be. And this was my work. This was just one of the sketches, and I made all the sets for Turn of the Screw by Benjamin Britten um, opera. But when I left the Royal College, they all thought, I would never get a job and I was useless because I didn't fit in and nobody encouraged me to do theatre or anything. So I went and did more, ran a, had my own graphics company and stuff like that. But then I made this piece in 1993 with some architects in London and I think it was the first time colour was in the streets in London <laughs> in, in this form because there was a newspaper article about it and they wanted to... Um, tear it down because it was too colourful. So if we now, don't worry, we're not going to go through millions of past, we're going to fast forward now, but you, this is quite interesting. This was 1993 and this is 2016, the Design Museum, and I haven't looked at that old hoarding for a really long time, but then I can see how there's a real similarity to it. This is a wall that moves, it's a tri one of those advertising panels that moves around. So this is the top of the new design museum in London. So finding belonging. So I spent many years feeling a little bit of an outsider and feeling that I wasn't doing the right work and what was I doing and all this sort of stuff. And, and it's taken me, I think I'm a slow burner, it took me a long time to find my way. Um, and I realized because I was one of three sisters and my dad, because he was an artist, he didn't care if we had our own bedrooms or, you know, we were all in the same room and I never really had any space. And so I realized that actually what belonging meant to me was having my own space. And this, I found this, this building in 2005 and I live above it with my partner Luke and, and, and our dog Elvis, and my studio is in the back. And the moment I found that, I sort of knew I belonged in London, but I didn't really um, f 
feel that I'd found my place yet. And then when I found this, then it all came together. And because it's all about having things at hand, doing what I want to do, it, I just absolutely love it. And because I found my sense of belonging, I, I, it's been fascinating for me to find out how you, you do that with work, with other people, with communities. This is my studio. And so, sometimes this is my old dog, Lemmy, and my new dog's Elvis. That's a bit sad, old dog and new dog, but sadly, uh, uh, Lemmy died, and so now I have Elvis. And then this is Luke Morgan, who I work with on lots of projects. So sometimes I work on my own, sometimes I work together, and sometimes, um, and this is a project we did, a sign machine, and sometimes we go to various different countries and just build. We don't even really know what's going to be there. Um, to help us build, and this one, we had limited materials, you can see. So I'm just going to play this, and lots of volunteers help us paint. So um, how do I, when I make big, in, so I make big installations, um, and I, I, I think I'd been wanting, oh, that just went, I think I'd been wanting to make them for years and years, but I hadn't really found my place, and then I was given this space, and I just went to this bit of earth, and I was told to do something, and I was quite scared, and I couldn't come up with anything. And then the person who asked me to do it said, if you don't come up with it today, Morag, you're not going to do it. So I went home <laughs> and thought I'd better do something then quick. And then I'd been... Um, oh, sorry. I'd been working with um, uh, the poet Lem Cizé on a, um, another p a piece, a permanent typographic piece. And then I just read this tweet of his that day. He'd write a tweet, and it just was absolutely perfect for this piece of work I wanted to do. And then I just made this model, like, in a real frenzy. Luke had gone out for a drink, and by the time he'd come back, I'd done it. And then I just said, that's it. And the next day, I showed it to them, and then we built it. And so I didn't look at, I didn't put lots of things in front of me, but what I think I do need is I need to think about things for quite a while and things are embedded in my brain, and then something will come out. Um, so that project was an amazing project to do and gave me the confidence to make these, um, these installations. And so we were asked, it was mentioned earlier, to do this agape, um, which was a temple of love, no religion, nothing, just about love. And then there were masses of restrictions. You know, they want us to build a temple, but they want us to build it on the stairs. It's like, can't they give us a bit of ground? No, on the stairs. And then they want it also to go two levels, and then they also want us to put things around the trees that are listed. And it's just like, oh my God, so many things. But those things are there to challenge us. And then they gave me the Martin Luther King quote, um, and I could do whatever I wanted with it. I could use one word, I could do as much as I liked. Now, I had been to India previously, and I just loved... Th this was in Delhi, and this um, uh, motorway was just being built, and there was this amazing temple, monkey temple, and I just loved that juxtaposition of the concrete and the colour, which is what I had in the location that I was working. And again, I just I let it keep in my mind, and then I just did a drawing on the train and thought, that's it, I'm going to do this, and then I built the, the piece. So I can't really... It, I can only post-rationalise why I did those things, and afterwards I realised it's from travelling and seeing lots of things. And then this was the first time I worked... The South Bank Centre wanted me to work with volunteers. I got all these people in, I showed them how to paint, we had lots of food, you could stay for a day or for three weeks, and most people stayed for three weeks. And we took lots of photos. 
And this is the final piece. So it's totally hand-painted. And the idea of it is a celebration of love on the outside, like a peacock. And then on the inside, so this is the stairway through. And there were thousands of people going through. And then inside, there wasn't really any painting, and it was all about the light coming through the cuts out in the wood, and so it was a much more contemplative space. So looking and seeing, now that's um, a big thing that I've been looking at, I've been looking at, sorry, I've been thinking about this year, and um, about when you look and how the difference between looking and seeing. So I um, worked on this piece, uh, which was just, it was for an exhibition, it was just expressing, it, it, I, I haven't got more to say about that one, I'm just showing you. <laughs> but what I do do is, that's why I was talking about that embedded memory, is I go to lots of places and there's certain things that catch my eye, and I just love the backs of um, uh, advertising boards and you know, this is just outside LA, just, this is in Myanmar, you know, just looking at various things everywhere, and I just sort of collect those things in my brain. I think I also, obviously, from my circus background, have an obsession with circus. I, I really love this branding, isn't that brilliant? I mean, it's totally branded, and it's totally different, it's fantastic. And then just people, this was in Myanmar, Oh, these are actually kids' chairs, so when the people aren't there, everything is like miniature. It's really strange. And then these beautiful colors the women have got on, and, and then the, the, the earth colors of the buildings behind. And also, from my travels, I realized that I was going to look at um, what my what clothes I wore, and if my clothes rate related to my work. And it did seem that throughout the time, I, I take a picture each time of my suitcase, and it does actually seem the phases I'm going through with color does come out in my suitcases. So, I really had an amazing, I really love Mexico, and I'd never been, but I just love all the, everything about what I understood about Mexico. And then I had some British Council delegates came to my studio, and the next thing they happened is they rang me up and they said, would you um, make a big installation in Mexico City? So this is Christmas in my house, so you see how much I like the Day of the Dead and things. So, uh, um, and so, because of the budget for this project, I couldn't go to Mexico, um, so they had to send me videos. So they sent me video of this place, and I thought, hmm. And I looked it up on the internet. I thought, well, that looks like a nice big place to do an installation. Of course, it's Zocala Square in the middle of Mexico City. And then they said, OK, you want that space, Morg? And I said, yes, please. And so the next thing was, is, is what do we do in that amazing space? And the subject of this, it was for a festival, a design festival, and the festival was about um, iteration about how designers and artists think. And I felt that I wanted, it was about that looking and seeing thing again. It was about going to places you'd never been before and how amazing thing, things can be when you first see them, but when you see them every day, you don't look at them. So I'd watched this, I've always liked the title of this book, but never quite understood it, to be honest. And, um, and then I remember this film, this is a Hitchcock film. A matter, I think it's a matter of life and death. And I used to watch television all the time when I was a child, and lots of films, and I remembered this film. It's a lovely picture. He's taking the big white garden table to project on. You'd be glad you're coming over. He's showing it to the dogs now. Ah, nice day. Hmm, Mrs. Bidwell's ducks out too early. She'll lose all the eggs if she's not careful. Ah, the start of the cycling season. There's a hefty young girl. Time Mrs. Tucker went to get our rations. There she is. Oh, the vicar and his sister. Not coming here, I hope. No, good. And he, and, and that's a camera obscura, and I just thought when I watched that was so magical. This person had a room and image came inside the room, how amazing was that? And so we wanted, so we decided to make this, 
big camera obscura in the me middle of Mexico City. And this is it. So <laughs> the people would queue up. They didn't actually know what they were queuing up for, but that was OK. <laughs> They queued all around the corner. And then um, these other people are queuing for something else, but we've got some people queuing here. And then they'd come in, and depending on whether the weather was good, because I wanted to do it with the lens, but we couldn't get a lens big enough in Mexico, so we just did it with the original pinhole camera. So was, you did need quite a lot of light. But if you came in, then it brought the whole of the view from down the road into it. And it was just an amazing um, being able to make it. Um, and here it is. So, but what was so incredible about doing this is people didn't actually realize that the image would be color. They thought it would be black and white, which was interesting. And they didn't realize it would move either. So, and so there was this whole um, educational um, part of it that we hadn't even really anticipated, um, which was a really lear learning curve for us as well. So um, I'm often, people always often ask me at the end, oh, you just do temporary projects. What if you did permanent projects? And so I thought that I would um, show you a permanent project. And what I think is really nerve-wracking about doing a permanent project or semi-permanent, I mean, what is permanent? But, you know, something beyond three months or something. This is probably maybe six or ten years. Um, and is that people lose... People, their judgments change when they do permanent and they get too serious and they get scared and they ask you questions like, do you know it's going to last forever? And it's like, of course I don't know it's going to last forever, but let's just try something. You can always take it down afterwards. So this is a big iconic place in London, Battersea Power Station, which is now being refurbished. And I was asked to do... Uh, is an art commission, the first entrance into the new space that's connecting the Thames with the building. And these are the doors that were originally in the um, building. And these are my uh, sketches. I've got to actually admit I'm po this post-rationalizing. I'd already done that and then saw those. But anyway, that's <laughs> they go together of the period. It was the period. And then, just in Battersea Park, there was the Festival of Britain. And I, I mean, I never saw this, but it looked like it was absolutely incredible, these buildings there. So, so I made this um, model of these elements. And, and, you know, I'm the first person to do it. It's called Be I'm the first person to make an art piece for this building. So, it's called Battersea, it's called Battersea Power Station, so I'm going to own the word power. So I took power. And this is, and then I painted it in my studio, the whole thing with lots of other people. This is how simple it is. You don't need lots of things, just rulers and tape. And you can make permanent pieces. And then these are the letters painted in the studio. And this is my happy dance. <laughs> when it's all finished, it has to be all completely finished. And this is the final piece. And it's been there a year now. And the only thing that is, is really affected is the baubles. And that was the guy who built it. Because I said to him, those baubles are going to bleach out. And they did. So he's got to replace the baubles. But otherwise, it stood the test of time. Because it's really hard to make something that's next to the Thames. The weather's quite strong. You know, you have to get the painting exactly right. And there you can see it against all the grey. There's my little, little bit of colour. <laughs> Thank you. So united by pattern. So I mean, I'm, I don't really um, know what's going to come next. Different projects come along. And in a way, I quite like people choosing me to do things. And this is um, in Graz in Austria. Um, it's a very, this is a socialist workers building, but it was really quite not used, a bit run down. And I, it's actually just opened today. It's a festival, a really avant-garde contemporary art festival called Steer Bicker Hipst, which I can't pronounce properly, sorry. Um, and we were asked to work with a gallery to make this 
piece of work about, about Gratz being open to everybody, but migrants to be welcome, and it was called Open Doors, and, and not to, um, to try and... It's quite... It's, ghetto is quite a hard word, but it's quite divided in Gratz, and they wanted to bring people together. So we came up with this idea, this, um, this gateway, and I'll show you in a minute. And then I worked with loads of different groups, many different groups. These boys at the end here, we did actually have to pay them to do the, <laughs> to do the um, workshop because they were teenagers, they weren't sure. But they absolutely loved it. And the gang leader um, made this one, this really pretty one with all the hearts on it. So I think he, you know, I think you sometimes have to give people opportunities to do things that they didn't think they would necessarily like doing. And this was the final piece. So with the workshops, I made flags around the city, and then I built this piece that um, had all these doors that were not restricted. It was completely open that people could go into this space. And then in the space, all the different groups of um, nationalities would, have, would make recipes to give to each other. So it was all about sharing. And then they had a cookbook as well, so the space was just, just trying to get people to start thinking differently. Um, okay, so making things together, well, hospitals. So um, it is proven, people, I did a talk the other day about my work in hospitals, and somebody is saying to me, is it all evaluated and all that sort of stuff. I haven't got that information. Um, but I know that I, the feedback is that, that people are happier being in those spaces. But I think that if other people can evaluate all those things, I think it's their job and, and, and feed it back to me. That, that would be great. But, but there is proof. This, was, this piece of work on the side here was with um, University College London, and, and they, their arts program said there is, there's proof that, the, that it does reduce stress and it's for well-being. So I worked again with the poet Lem Cizé, and we, um, when you work with children in hospitals, because they have, it's quite complex, they have lots of drugs and various things, it's not the same as working with children in schools who are all energetic. You have to be very gentle. And um, Lem just managed to, uh, write these poems with these young patients, and then I did uh, visual workshops with them. We made this alphabet. I, we talked through the words they liked best. And so this is, it was for a series of dining rooms in the um, Children's Hospital in East London, and this was their words. So it was really beautiful. The, the poem was about how they were describing the walls in the room about them being sunshine and full of laughter. It was just so beautiful. And then that, and the alphabet was made from their sketches. And then this was by a little seven-year-old who wrote half in Urdu and half in English, and I did the, the graphic for it. And this one did scare the nurses um, because it was for two-year-olds, the word dazzle, but they absolutely loved the word dazzle. So this is Christmas in the hospital, in a brand new hospital. And I, I was asked to go and have a look at it. And I thought, hmm, could try a little bit harder. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to make this place that the moment the children and the families and their, their brothers and sisters, their siblings came in, they just felt that people were there to help them. And because children stay in hospitals sometimes for a very long time, you want it to feel really welcoming. And then this was the, the, the corridor. So this was just out in the corridors. This was completely hand-painted, and I will say I am never going to do that again. <laughs> because it took forever. And then they told us the Queen was going to come, and then it was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so the Queen did come, and she, it was the only time that um, she would go somewhere where there was fresh paint, because she won't go when there's fresh paint. because She doesn't like the smell, but she let me off. So thank you, Queenie. And um, so I've been let loose quite a lot in the corridors, in the public spaces, in hospitals. 
But I'd never been, but the bedrooms are quite sacred areas where the clinical staff are not that happy if people bring art into those spaces. But um, an amazing woman from art felt a commissioner, because we're really dependent as artists and designers on how good the commissioners are, how much people want to collaborate with you. And um, she'd seen me talk somewhere, and she just said to me, Moag, I've got this commission to do the bedrooms in this new children's hospital in Sheffield. The architects had designed the spaces like this, which, you know, very neat. No, nice and neat. And, and had really thought through where all the plugs were and, you know, and everything. And, you know, very nice. But they needed something that was, um, you know, would, that made it homely for the young patients. So I went away and did loads of designs and went up to Sheffield and did this presentation all enthusiastic with all this stuff and everything. And the nurses and the clinical staff, there was about 30 of them, all really nice and everything. Next day, I get a phone call going, um, the nurses thought you were really nice, but they don't want you anywhere near those bedrooms because you're, they're really worried you're going to give all the kids hallucinations and all the, you know, thing. And I said, OK, OK, let's, let's just not, you know, throw everything out. Let's just think about this carefully because I'd, I... I wanted to make spaces, I didn't want it just to be about pattern and bright color, I wanted it to make an environment that was stimulating, not too stimulating, but was homely and made people feel better. So what I did was I, because people also at the moment, you know, you're judging, these, these clinical staff, they've just been in a hospital helping somebody and then they're coming out and then they're looking at these crazy things on a screen they, you know, it's, it's very hard to connect if you're not used to doing it. So I sent up um, five models of the bedrooms, and we took, and Kat Powell from Artfelt took them. I wasn't there, so nobody had to feel obliged to me. <laughs> and they took them out, and then they showed it to all the, um, to as many patients as possible, and 92% said they wanted the bedrooms. So I went back to the clinical staff, and we all sat down, and then they, and the nurses, they were all much more positive and said, all that I needed to do was give them a blue room that they could move the um, blue-green room that they could move the um, very ill children into and then move them out at different times. So, you know, we worked together and we made that happen, and I think that is, you know, really positive. And so this was the room before, and this is the final rooms. So I didn't put the pet teddies on the bed. There's no children in the bedrooms um, it's, it, uh, because it was just prior to them moving in. But it was even really important, the slight color of the floor. I made it a slightly warmer gray, and it just made everything a lot warmer. And what the best outcome is now, they are in the hospital, the, the hospital is open, the clinical staff are happy, and that's as important as the patients as being happy, that they, because they have to work in that space. And so I think sometimes you just have to take people through the process, and then they will, you know, they'll l like it. And if you, if you, what, now this exists, if there was another project, somebody can take people to this project and then show how the value of this work. So making public, I'm not doing too badly. I'm getting through my tool. How many things have I got? Oh, yeah, I think I might do it. Um, uh, I'm only up to 31 minutes. OK. Um, so um, in Sweden, so this is a completely different project in Sweden, um, where it's, it's another hospital project. And it's a 200-meter corridor from one side of the hospital to the other side in Lynn Chopping. It's a university hospital in Sweden. And this one, I, I was collecting my color tweets for two years. And this is where, if you take down your archive of your tweets, this is what it looks like, which I think is quite, pretty, you know, I, I really like that. And then I decided to, um, for this project, what do you do for 200 meters piece of work? It's like, oh my God. And, um, and then I just felt that actually these mood tweets were about the color I felt in the morning, the color I felt at night. Even though 
the hospital is not about me, but it's about people, it's about people's thoughts and how you feel and how things can change your thought process throughout the day. So I um <laughs> So that's a year of my colours, morning and night. So I sort of mapped it all out, first in stripes, and I thought, well, that's sort of quite interesting, but a little bit boring. So then I decided that the day isn't really like that. It's not how you feel at night and how you feel in the morning. In between, there's all these things that happen. So then I broke all the colours down to being more fractal. So, um, so this is how long a year is. And then it was right, oh gosh, how do we make it then? And then bringing wood into a hospital is really difficult. So it took me, this project probably took three years to make happen, to make it so that I could make it out of wood and in a way that the hospital would accept it. And then this, and then now I, when I paint, I pay people to come in and help me paint. So that I had like a big team of people painting triangles. And they all have to map all together to, to work. And this is the final piece. It took two years to, not two years, like, <laughs> non-stop to install. It took two phases. We did one phase and another phase. And this is the piece. And this is how long it is. <laughs> and this is speeded up as well, or oh, I'm a slow runner. That's it, we're at the end now. <laughs> okay, so, um, so back to um, making, just working with people. When you work with people in, on social projects, you learn as an artist designer so much from them and you never know, it's not like being in my studio when I'm doing that last project where that's completely controlled, I know exactly what I'm doing. When I, when I work on other projects, I just have no idea what we're going to get. And people always want me to tell them in advance, and I don't really know. So you probably heard of the horrendous disaster that we had called Grenfell Tower in London. And eight years previous to that, there was this disaster also in this Sioux Tower estate where the people were told to stay inside their flats and they died. And so this estate is connected to the South London Gallery. And I was asked to... So, so they, the South London Gallery had started doing this workshop with the young um, people, uh, like an arts club. And then when they rebuilt the building, on the bottom, it, they were given this new art club. And then their idea was to work with an artist to get the um, young... to get the kids to be involved in their, in their space. So I did lots of workshops, and so you can see here, this was their pattern, and then I made it into this piece for them, just took elements of the pattern. So I did workshops, and we had poetry, and then in the end, we transformed this. It was a beautiful white space, but it wasn't very stimulating. And, and what was so fantastic, working with the young people, their kids, I suppose, working with the young, with young people, they couldn't believe that their work that they'd made in the workshops was then transformed on the walls, which was just great. So, because the problem with these estates in London is 
all the little kids, they all will engage in art, shop, art things, but when they get to teenagers, then they all go in gangs, and that's when we've got lots of gun culture in London. And so the, what, we, what we were trying to do with this art um, space was to show that you can continue with art throughout your life. You don't have to give it up when you're little and show the possibilities of what you can make with it. So I'm going to... I'm still okay for time, so I'm going to play this a little bit. This was a film made by the gallery about the space, and it's just really beautiful. This, last year, this was the best project I, I did, I felt I did. So this is a really exciting day. As you can hear, there's lots of people doing art. I'm Morag Myerskov, I'm a designer and artist, and at the moment, I'm at the opening of the art block. They even Very made a cake. To welcome you to this celebration of the opening of Art Block. Art Block is part of Open Plan, which is a bigger programme played out across three estates, local to South London Gallery, with the aim of bringing artists into the everyday life of residents, but also with the aim of involving residents more in the life of the South London Gallery. It's a new Art Block where the kids can come and just do art, make things, and just enjoy themselves. They had had a space that they had made their own and it was an amazing identity, little small space. And then they were given this wonderful new space. It was a white walled new building that it didn't belong to them. So the whole part of my brief was to come and make a space that they belong to. So the way I approached that was to get them to make the art. So I did workshops with them, pattern workshops, word workshops and various things. And then out of it, I took their work and then I transformed it into the space that you can see now. My name is Kudada and I'm nine years old. At one of the workshops, I did a little bit of art and we had to design our own kind of like picture. So there was kind of shapes and we had to make our own picture out of it. The thing that I like about the new place is that the new place is big because the old place was too small for me to dance, but now the big space is better for me to do that. And there's lots of different colours on the walls. My um, project is named The Club Under My House, and we got that from one of the workshops with the young people where we had a poet that came in and he worked with them. What, what, what is this, this, this place? Maybe it'll be the arts, the, the art club. A club, okay. Do you want to write that down? A club under your house. I like that. If you had a club under your house, what would that club be? What would go on there? What would you like people to feel like when they see the art? Happy. Okay. I think that's really nice. In one of the workshops, Brahim, he designed some letters, he wrote to Word, and I thought they looked really amazing, so I then made an, an alphabet out of them. I developed his font, not really very much, just to make it into a full alphabet, and then translated and painted it. We also made curtains from his work, and the heart on the wall is his as well. Murad has collaborated with the children to bring this about. It's beautiful because it is a relationship between the artist and the community. Those who live in this area have then been able to be involved in the creative process of putting this building together. My responsibility is to tell them that they are creative, they can create, they can go on to do this in the future as a... So, um, so in the streets, so I have got 10 minutes left, I think that's right. So I might speed up through a few of them. Ooh gone very bright. Is that right? They do, I, oh, okay. Seems like it's the screen's gone a bit. Um. So um, I was asked last year to do, because London, you know, uh, you probably heard, I don't think it's quite as bad as Donald Trump makes out it is, but, um, you know, there's, it's, you know, it's quite um, depressing at the moment. Um, with the various attacks and also with Brexit, that's the whole of the UK. So um, I was asked to do this piece in the streets and I just felt that I wanted to make a piece that was just about um, joy and peace. And this, uh, so I was given this park um, that basically only people went because they liked smoking drugs in there and, um, and mainly builders, which worried me slightly about what they were building. 
Um, and so it was to try and make this space much more inviting for everybody. But the statue there, she is a, uh, a piece, a statue of peace. So it made sense that this was a peace pavilion. And we're measuring her at the moment. And so I just, I don't, again, I never really quite know why I come up with these structures. It looks a bit like somebody with their hands out, but that wasn't intentional. And so this is a peace pavilion, and each of the symbols mean different things. And then this was the joy um, space, the, the joy installation. And we made it again. So uh, I made the, um, the bridge one, Battersea, and this all at the same time. It was just like unbelievable last year painting so much. But we have oh, fun. That's fantastic. So this yeah. is us. That's so great. Okay. Just because they look so cute yeah. in the studio, we had to make this video. And then this was the piece, um, the final piece on the street. And people just, it was, you know, it was just a, this, this is the Barbican Centre in London. It's really, really um, a, be a beautiful centre, but very. Um, harsh environment, and this was a pavilion. And then they had performances and various things happening in it throughout the summer, which was just really lovely. And it just shows the whole dynamic and it shows the potential that could happen in that space that was sort of not working. And then the pieces, this is a really important part of my work, the pieces went to a school and we installed them in the school and we gave them to the school. So finally, almost finally, we're going to talk about making belonging. So I've always been really, really obsessed with bandstands. I love the shape of bandstands. I love this, fil I love this bit of this film. I think this is Top Hat or something like that. When they're dancing in a bandstand. So I think I'm an old romantic, really. I quite, I quite like all these films. So, and these, and it's a very sort of, bandstands are very, I mean, it's a global thing, but there's many, many were built in the UK and always at seasides and various things. So I, I, was, I did some experiments making some bandstands and I nearly made this permanent bandstand but then they didn't quite have the money so we didn't make it. So I was asked to go to this place called Ditchling in Sussex and the director at the time said to me, you know, would you be interested in doing a project with us? What's, what interests you? And I said, I want to make these bandstands and I'm obsessed by belonging. And he said, well, that's really good because we're going to have a Corita Kent exhibition here. So, and you will probably all know about Corita Kent. Um, interestingly, in Britain, a lot of people haven't heard of her before. Um, I only came, I only sort of knew of her work in 2008. Um, but she is quite an amazing woman. And so they were going to do the first exhibition of her work really in a, a museum in, in the UK. Um, and so our work seemed to sort of have a, a sort of a connection. So then I did my piece of belonging, an installation. Her work is in one room and my, uh, my expression of belonging with my partner Luke is in the other room. So this is Luke is all about psychobilly and rock and roll. That's the music you've been, and mine is all about family. And we share this space in the gallery, uh, expressing our sense of belonging. And then we've got this this uh, sign that that people can interact with and decide wh what they believe is belonging to them is. So there was a celebration. So to make this bandstand, I wanted, in the spirit of um, Carita Ken, I, I'm, you probably all read this book, but this book is amazing, her book, of all her exercises of how she, how she taught. Um, in the, I, I, I wanted to work with lots of groups, and so 
I wrote um, some exercises in the vein of Carita Kent. And when I went read that book, I realized that maybe I had been taught in the same way as she used to teach, because there were a lot of similarities in the way I think about things. She talked about looking and seeing and all sorts of things like that. Um, so these are my workshops. I did like eight or nine workshops all around Sussex. That's near Brighton. And these groups of people were from a community center, and they'd never been in a workshop before, and they absolutely loved it. So what we did, we used words. We wanted to find out what every, each group felt that belonging meant to them. And what we found at the end, that obviously, at different times in your life, belonging means a very different thing. So when you're little, as a child, it's like your family and your pets and you know, all sorts of things like that. And when you're older, it's mainly your friends because maybe your family aren't around so much. And so it was just really good to learn this. And then I took their, some of the groups, one of the groups on the left, New Haven, they even set up their own belonging festival. So they made their own placards. With the others, I got them to describe what they wanted me to do, and then I made placards for them to describe their sense of belonging. With Brighton um, University helped me paint the placards. Here they are in the, my studio. And then I, I painted, because there was a very low budget on this project, I painted the whole of the rest of the bandstand myself. <laughs> which was quite hard work. But anyway, I did it. No, I don't, you know, I, I shouldn't be sympathy for myself. Um, so, and then this is the bandstand on the thing. So each time it traveled around to nine locations, each of the groups it went to, it went to each of the community groups and the bandstand. This was for the Brighton Festival. But then it went to this local estate and what the woman, so behind there is a community center, and the woman was like, set, who runs it just said, just having the bandstand outside made all the people gravitate to it, and they had much better uh, festival than they'd ever had before, and they wanted the bandstand to stay. It was really lovely, and you know, they wanted to come back every year. So on the road, so moving on from that, there is a big um, uh, sort of, oh, I've got one minute. Oh, uh oh. Okay, we won't talk about that one then. So, but I don't know, there's a mad, ray, there's a mad thing about making coloured crossings at the moment. So I've just, I did this one up in Leeds, the last one, and this one um, I'm doing in Borough in London. But London have suddenly now bought out a, um, a design manual for London, and basically I don't think they want colour crossing, so these ones are on hold at the moment, we'll just have to see. But they're all based on looking around at the architecture and taking shapes and then making patterns from them. So the la what my last note is, of all the things, what I do is I make temporary things and then I feed those into permanent things, and so they, they all mix together. And, and collaborating with people is so important, and making sure that you make things that people want. Because when you leave them, they, they want, you, know, you want them to love it and look after it. Um, but one of the biggest things you've got to do when you do work and, uh, is to play and to have fun, and just sometimes make things that don't mean very much, they're just fun. So, um, here is a, a few I've done. So last year, in, well this year in Indaba, with, Christina met me there. Um, I made this just playground for this festival, and it wasn't. It was just for people to hang out, and it was just it didn't. It wasn't anything particular. It was just a playground, but I can take those things and feed them into something else. So people just hung out at lunchtime, and and these are they. They did performances on the stages. Oh, that's me. Happy dance. But what was so amazing about it was when it finished, because it was only there for four days, what a waste, you know, you shouldn't really make those things for four days. There was this amazing social group in, in, in uh, Cape Town who took all the pieces and reused them, repurposed them, and they completely decorated this library. They made tables, and then in another place, they covered this a place in the townships. And it was just like fantastic. I mean, that for me was worth more than doing the big bit. I think that was just fantastic. This was a piece at the Life is Beautiful Festival last year in Las Vegas. 
I did paint that nearly all on my own, and that nearly killed me as well <laughs> in the heat. But um, you know, it's a big piece. And at night, we use I use neon paint, and so if you put a black light on it, it doesn't need other lights; it just glows. And then this is a wonderful project in Romania. It's super hot, just because I saw pictures of everybody, and they just looked all sort of cool and nice, and it was hot there, so we called it super hot. And this year we did an extension on it called Superstar, and um, super cool as well. And but this <laughs> this slide here, I didn't actually realize there were going to be children at this festival. And then these kids just went absolutely crazy. Has it gone? What was that? Should have. Oh yeah, there they are. So this was the extension this year. And then look at these kids. I mean, they were just like, I look at the sides. There's no sides on it. <laughs> so this year I got them to get rid of the slide because I was completely petrified I was going to kill a child. And um, and I and it was just too scary. So I um yes, but but they were excited and it was quite exciting. So, thank you for listening.